If you're a residential real estate agent earning $200,000 a year and you want to grow your passive income, this show's for you. Learn the secrets other agents use and hear from experts in our field in order to guide you along your journey to investing in assets like apartment communities so that you can turn your commissions into cash flow. I'm Randall DeCleared. Let's go, baby. All right. We've spent a lot of time talking to top producers on the show and um, we've learned what they're doing in their brokerage business to grow their active income. Um, I've talked to a lot of operators who are buying multifamily. I've talked to some industrial uh, commercial real estate guys, talked to a number of different people in the field. Um, and we, we seem to somehow still get away from a lot of the nuts and bolts of what it is to invest in a property and what it looks like to go out and buy something um, as a real estate agent to uh, start growing your passive income. So today I brought on Miriam Valencia. She is a broker or an agent out in the um, uh, Houston market in Houston, Texas. Uh, She's a three-time top producer at NAN and Company Properties, and they're affiliated with Christie's International. So um, I wanted to bring her on. We have this conversation just because, again, she's top producer. So we're, we're, we were initially going to start talking about just brokerage and kind of what that looks like and how she's built her team. Um, and then I asked her specifically about some some investing that she has done. And she just started investing just recently. Um, she bought her first single family house that she lives in. And then she went out and bought a an investment property. And so because... I want you to learn exactly how these transactions happen and how you can own or finance a property because that's her specific way that she sold this property and is is building her cash flow up. Um, I wanted to hone in very detail with her on on how that deal looked and what it looks like to do something like that. And so we spend the majority of our conversations talking about that. And and uh, so I. If you're looking to either own or finance, or you're just going to want to hear the story about how she she did that, um, this is going to be a great show for you, and I think you're going to get a lot out of it. As always, uh, if you could go on, like, rate, and review um, anywhere you listen to the show, that helps us out a ton. Um, helps me bring on amazing guests and continue uh, bringing you some content. So do that, and without further ado, let's have the chat with Miriam. Let's go. All right. Hey, Miriam, welcome to the show. It's awesome to have you on today. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Um, why don't we kick it off? I know you and I were just talking about your your focus is on social media and some of the things that you do on that front. Um, as agents, we are always out there. We're always uh, putting ourselves out there in some form or fashion, or you should be if you're not. So what are some strategies that you uh, talk about and that you would recommend people using? Um, I think more of a strategy is definitely putting a schedule for yourself, time blocking to make sure that you do have the the time to market yourself, whether it's on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever it is where your audience is more targeted is where you want to put your focus on. For example, my focus started on TikTok and branched out into Instagram and Facebook. And now I'm starting to branch out into LinkedIn and trying to use the newest forums such as threads twitter not so much <laughs> yeah so yeah i've heard about threads my my guys have told me i need to download it and start using it um so when did you so you started on tiktok and like what content were you putting out that you you saw was resonating actually was um getting the most either followers or building your following what was it that you were doing I was putting home tours in Spanish because I started um, whenever I actually started my career in search of Spanish resources and wanting to put that out there for the community. So I realized there were a lack of resources. I've seen it grow just in the past few years that I've been in the industry. But when I started, there was nothing out there in Spanish. It was very English focused, English oriented. Um, I really had to find lenders who are willing to communicate with clients in Spanish and also lenders who were honest with integrity because there were a lot of shady things going on in the in the Spanish real estate market where I had to really delegate which ones were the ones that I wanted to work with. So that was really how my career started taking off. And in the past three years, now with my team, We've helped over 162 families and we just surpassed 32 million in sales volume. Awesome. Yeah. Congrats. Uh, It's very cool. That's why we wanted you on the show because you're doing some things, making some moves. Um, 
So, so again, on TikTok, let's go back to the social media and, and, um, when, so what, what, what was the ramp up? Like how, how many posts did you have to get to before you started seeing some traction or was it like, boom, instant, you had some kind of, uh, positive feedback on that because I'm, this is selfish. Like I'm, I'm doing this currently. <laughs> I, I gotta know. Teach it me. Took, yes. It, it did take some time. Um, roughly at around 80,000 followers on TikTok. I would say if I had stayed more consistent, it probably would have been a lot bigger than it is now. And, um, that's just because I know the past year I have been heavily focused on Instagram opposed to TikTok. Uh, and it's just because my marketing has taken a different route. So with TikTok, uh, the algorithm was posting two to three times a day, using the trendy sounds, putting the captions, using the words, always trying to use the what the that has to offer, like what TikTok has to offer you. If you go to Instagram, you want to use what Instagram has to offer you so it can push out more in their algorithm. Okay. So, so then, you, but you got up to 80,000. Are you still posting on TikTok? I am, but I don't post every day and I don't post the two to three times a day like I used to. Okay. Um, but, it's a lot of work. It's another job. Oh, and I sure. with my team taking uh, my time now, it's really difficult for me to still do the two to three times a video on TikTok and manage my team. That's my balance right now, but it's definitely possible. I will go back to it. I have my mindset set on like, I will definitely get my reach up there just so I can keep getting generating leads for my team. That's the crux of it. The question is like, what has it done? If you have 80,000 followers, can you point to it and say that produces me one deal a month that produces me uh, 50 leads a day? Like, what, what does that translate into? Yeah, absolutely. Um, roughly around two deals a month. Okay. Uh, and for my team, another two to three deals. Okay. So personally you're taking, and then you're, and then you're sharing that with your team as well. Right. Um, so that's I'm transitioning what... more to the buyers, passing them on to my team so that again, I can very, I can focus more on my team. Okay. Yeah. And then I, I, I want to talk about your team, your setup, the market you're in, all of those things. I touched on a little bit in the intro, but um, we, we, I want to dive into that. But since we're talking social, I want to know kind of you've you've hit on something that's pretty interesting. So four to six deals a month coming from your 80,000 and that's directly from TikTok alone. Or do you have uh, that same sort of thing built up on Instagram? And, and so you're getting deal flow from that as well. Yeah, so my TikTok is connected to my Instagram. Anytime okay. somebody messages me, they can also contact me on Instagram. And most of the messages are, I found you on TikTok. How can I go on purchasing a house? Okay. So it's it's a flow through from both. Okay. And so why why are you branching out into LinkedIn? What is that doing for you now? I feel like LinkedIn is a professional or more professional a social media platform. With LinkedIn, you reach out to find resources, resources such as financial advisor who can help me write a PL for my team. So really setting up my team as a business and of doing a business structure opposed to just here are leads, let's sell real estate. Yeah, it's yeah, more okay. more of the back end work, and of course, the leads that you do. I've gotten one lead from LinkedIn since I started earlier this year. The leads can be a little bit more secure because you know on LinkedIn, people have, for the most part, can corporate jobs or they have established businesses. So when you market yourself on LinkedIn, you're marketing yourself to an entire different market than you would on people who are just scrolling on TikTok or just passing by on Instagram. It, yeah. It's with more purpose. Yeah. So when, when you're doing TikTok and Insta, are you, are those paid posts like sponsored or are you doing just free like content that you're putting out? TikTok is free content. I've never paid or advertised any videos there. Um, and with TikTok, it's more personal. I feel more comfortable getting on camera on TikTok and speaking without any makeup or even my hair and just a bun and ponytail. TikTok, it's more relatable and it's more personable. People want to see a human making mistakes, talking, showing your day to day. Instagram is a little bit more curated. You want to post the pretty photos, the fun events, 
sometimes you have to edit them a little bit so they can fit the Instagram culture. Very good tips. I like it. I like it. So <laughs> is that your main uh, lead source right now? Are you doing anything else to to market? I get a lot of referrals at this point, uh, referrals from my past clients, all the families that we've helped. Um, I, they're very, I stay connected with them through social media. I'll like their posts. I make sure to congratulate them. If they have any big events, such as a wedding, send a little gift, but it's always through social media. Okay. The ones who don't have social media, we do give Christmas gifts. We give pies for Thanksgiving. We did a Mother's Day photo shoot this year so that people with any one of our clients can come and take photos. Wow. So it's always trying to stay connected and that helps with our referrals. I work with several builders now and some of those builders were from referrals. Yeah. All right. So very cool. That's right off the bat. Some good information, good tips. If you're not uh, on social media or using it in a big way, um, follow some of those steps and grow following. We are literally doing that right now. I've got, I have a team that helps me do that just because it's, it's a, it is a lot of work. Um, and so I just get to, to see some of the stuff that they're working on. Um, and then, and then I'm on there commenting and posting because that I think is where the, the real, the magic happens, I think. Uh, so, all right, thanks for that. Why don't we go ahead and go back and tell, tell me a little bit about, you know, the team that you built, uh, the market you're in and, and really the price points and, and what you focus on with your team. Okay. So we are a team of six. We are in the Houston market and surrounding areas. Anywhere we'll work that has clients. We have builders in Livingston. We have builders in Waller, Texas and Interloop. We have builders everywhere. We've gone as far as LaPorte, Texas. So we are not afraid to, to make the drives because we know that our clients need the services and not a lot of real estate agents are willing to make those drives or do the effort, just the one extra little step. But that's what has gotten us, I think right now, just with us five, we have about 14 listings on the market and nine more coming soon. So our team is very goal oriented. And that comes from my own goals that I've always set myself. I'm very goal oriented and I have a number that I want us to reach. And we work and we meet every single week to run our numbers, make sure that we're on the path that we're supposed to be. And if not, we run and we try to see where are we lacking? What needs work? We're proud to be sponsored by Ridgeline Investment Group. Ridgeline has a track record of transacting more than 53 million in assets throughout Texas. Ridgeline's currently looking to acquire 100 to 200 unit class B multifamily communities between five and 20 million in San Antonio, Temple, Waco, Tyler, and other Texas secondary markets. To learn more about Ridgeline Investment Group, visit www.ridgelineig.com. All right. So you're there. What What's the price point really that you guys are focusing on? Right now we're in the mid 400s, four to 500s. Okay. Median. What's median in Houston? Median is right about 350, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Yeah. I think the last I looked in San Antonio were 320. That was maybe last month. So I don't know if it's changed much. Yeah. In, in Houston, I, I, we go over there quite a bit. Well, not quite a bit, a couple times a year. Um, and, and like the Heights area and that sort of thing is, is where we spend a lot of time, but it's a, it's a great market. All right. We, as we were talking earlier, I really want to focus most of this conversation around investing. Um, you are, you've been in real estate how long? Three years. Three years. Okay. And in that time you, you started your own team. Um, you built that up and you have purchased, uh, I guess a, a single family that you live in your current is that correct? Yes. Okay. And sure. then you bought an investment property. Is that right? Yes. All right, cool. So let's talk about uh, the whole idea of the show again is is building your cash flow up, getting that passive income coming in, whether it's through single family investments, uh, investing in apartments, investing in commercial real estate of any form or fashion, or even other uh, investments that will yield cash flow. That's the whole idea. You've started it. There are a lot of agents I know that have not invested any money at all. So let's walk through the process. You, you've you got a couple of properties. What is uh, your thought process when you first started looking at buying either your first house or your first investment property? 
it really came from my clients. I would see them doing it and I would think to myself, well, why can't I? I'm helping them. I'm running the numbers for them. I'm searching the properties for them. Why am I not doing this for myself? So that was my initial thought. And it really just made sense for me to purchase properties as well. I would see the equity they would build from selling. And I just thought, wow, that's amazing. Do that too, Miriam. <laughs> so that's yeah. really what started doing it, I started working with investors who wanted to flip homes. So we started running their numbers. What's going to be your net profit after you flip this home? Uh, is it a good investment? What is your, what's going to be your ARV? So always looking into those numbers. And also whenever my builders would start building, we would look at the comps in the area, the price per square foot. How much are they selling for? How much do you need to spend in order to make value and and not overspend? Because the house next door is selling for two fifty, and if you spent one eighty five on one eighty five on this home, you're not going to make too much. Um, and more than anything, again, like I said, selling. Once I saw my clients selling their home and seeing the equity they started making, that's really what got me going on. I need to start purchasing properties and I need to hold on to those properties because I want to be a millionaire one day and have that money and be safe and give my daughter a secured life and growing up because it's just myself and my daughter. So I wanted to make sure that, you know, I'm going to be working this hard so that maybe one day she can follow in my footsteps or at least not have to work as hard as I am. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so you took the step. When did you, uh, which one do you want to talk about? We can talk about the the first house you bought, or we can talk about the investment property. You tell me which one you want to cover and then we'll, we'll cover it. Yeah, we can start with the first one and then right. go into the investment property. Yeah, yeah. So okay. the first I purchased last year in November, it's a new construction home. I really wanted to purchase a duplex. I always told myself my first home was going to be a duplex, live on one side, let the other side pay my rent. Um, but I know myself and I, and I have a daughter, like I mentioned, I figured for her, it's better to put her in a single family home just so she can grow up in kind of a secure area. And I wanted to live below my means. I didn't want to overspend on my first house and, and purchase a $500,000 new construction property because I knew that next year I wanted to purchase an investment property. Um, so I found a, an adequate home for us in a in an area that's livable and it not breaking the bank. That one took me two years to to be able to get there because when I went through my divorce, my credit was so low. Um, I had switched to real estate. So I had just started as 1099. I needed two years of 1099. So I contacted my lender and I told him, give me a two year plan. I want to purchase my first property. And sure enough, we followed that plan, built my credit up. And when I was finally able to, I went under contract. I broke that contract and I went to look for another home until I finally found this one. <laughs> yeah. All right, let me let me break that down. Anyone listening? Okay, so it's very funny because I had another another guy uh, a while back, and um, he was like, "Yeah, I quit my job, and then I couldn't buy a house." It's the exact same situation. So if you are, you know, you're working, you have a W two, uh, definitely look at getting that loan ahead of time um, if you're looking to buy a property. But regardless, the the thing that I took away from that is the fact that you called a lender and you said, "What do I need to do?" give me the plan. And then you executed that plan. And that is just like first purchase one-on-one, like go talk to a broker and figure out, or, or a lender, figure out what you need to do to get qualified so that you are taking those steps and working on it um, so that you can go out and buy. Awesome. Congrats on that. Um, and the other thing I got out of it is that because you're so goal oriented and, um, and you, you sat down and you looked at your situation. You said, this is what I'm trying to do and trying to accomplish. Yes, a duplex would be great, but because I want my daughter to be growing up in a certain situation, then this works for me. So again, just having that conversation with yourself. And then you, again, you went out and you executed on that, uh, on on what was going to work for you. Okay. So now that you've done that and you have your, your primary residence sorted and take care of, like walk me through the steps that you took to go and buy your first investment property. So after I purchased my first property, I went back to my lender and told him I want to buy an investment property. What do I need to do? Um, the same thing. Same thing. And it's always the resources. It's like, well, tell me what I need to work on. Um, my debt to income at that point was a little bit high because after I bought my house, I knew I needed another car. And 
for tax purposes, it was better for me to purchase another car. I had gotten a financial advisor at that point um, because once I was I was running my numbers, I really wanted to keep investing and making sure that also my taxes were going to be correct the next year. So I started looking for a financial advisor and I found one. He's amazing. And he told me, you need to purchase a car if you don't want to pay a ton of taxes next year. So after I purchased my home, close on your home first and then buy a car for anybody listening. So I closed on my home. I bought my car for tax purposes and because I, I did need one. Um, and then he told me to leverage out my debt to income. So paying a little bit more on my car paying down my credit cards more, even though they were pretty low so I could purchase my home. And from then on, I went and I bought a home from well, the house that my ex-husband and I had. And I took it under my name and then resold it owner to owner. Because again, my my plan is long-term investment, that equity. And also it helps out with taxes too, because even if you buy a home, fix it, flip it, and then you sell it, you're going to have to pay taxes on that. So I'm always trying to do what makes the most sense in my situation. Everyone's situation is different. Next up was selling the home owner to owner with a little bit higher interest rate. And I purchased it. And that's really how I'm going to make my money. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So we're going to break down that strategy. Owner to owner, if you're listening and and for whatever reason, don't understand what that is. um, It's a seller finance, right? You own the property and then you can go and owner finance it. There are a lot of things that go into that. If you have an underlying loan on the property to a bank, there's a thing called a do on sale clause that you have to be aware of. Um, and so you're basically wrapping a loan. I don't know if that was your situation uh, or if you owned it free and clear, but yeah. Uh, so there's certain things that go into doing a, uh, a wrap. Um, and we can talk about that again. I have a, I have a course I'm coming out with that's free. If you want to go to commission to cashflow.com, then you can check that out. I'll put the link in the show notes. So the whole point, the thing that we want to, cover right now, I want to ask you about is, again, what were your numbers on that deal? Essentially, your all-in cost or maybe the loan amount. Maybe just kind of break it down for me and explain to me how an owner-to-owner strategy was the most uh, efficient way to sell it, right? Yeah. And I learned this again from one of my investors too. And it's always just picking their brain and, and taking what I think works best. So he, we did a long, um, we sold one of his lots and he sold it at a 10% interest, 15 year finance, 10%, 15 years with a 10% down payment. Yeah. And when I looked at his numbers and his, his was free and clear, so he didn't do the wraparound loan. Yeah. But when I looked at his numbers, it, it it was really smart. And I saw that he was just making a passive income um, from this sale, which is my my goal is always to have multiple passive incomes. Um, I considered my team as part of my passive income, because you do get a small commission from them. So that's why I seek out a financial advisor and I'm structuring it more as a business as opposed to just a team, because I want to make sure that it's making sense. Am I, am I getting more than what I'm putting in or am I spending too much? Where do I need to balance that? So with this home, I purchased it at a 7% interest and sold it with a 12% interest. Okay. So I was making, just a little bit, a little profit off of it, but long term, the interest that I gained from it, it's about thirty four thousand dollars. Okay, so let's break it down because I do this a lot. Like this strategy in particular, I really like this strategy. Um, and like I said, we're we're working on a, a fund that uh, it's not out yet, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. But the whole idea is you you buy a property and you're all in is. Let's call it e- for easy numbers, hundred thousand dollars maybe is is your all in purchase on this property plus rehab, whatever it is, and then you can turn around and owner finance that property for one hundred and seventy five or whatever that number is, right? You get a down payment, so you took what ten percent down? Did you take a down payment? Yes, I did take a ten. It was ten percent down. Okay, so you got ten percent down. Um, even say you sold it for two hundred thousand for easier numbers. So now you you create a loan for one hundred eighty thousand dollars. Ten percent of two hundred is twenty thousand. So you got twenty thousand dollars in your pocket, and then you have a note for one hundred and eighty, and you're all in maybe a hundred thousand. So if you're paying seven percent on a hundred thousand, and this is a made up number, I don't know what your numbers were, but if you're paying seven percent interest on a hundred thousand dollars, and then you're you're collecting, you know, twelve percent or eleven percent or ten percent on 
uh, $180,000, not only do you have an equity spread, but you have a, an interest rate spread across that. So you have a large delta and that cash flow is coming in. I mean, on a deal like that, that I just described, I'm sure it'd be, you're, you're, you're probably, I don't know, over a thousand dollars a month in passive income on a deal if it was that juicy, but I don't, you know, that's, that's, uh, not very often that you're doubling the sale price, of yeah. your purchase price. you know what I mean? Um, so back in the day that happened a lot. Like I bought a bunch of houses for $20,000 back in the day and I could easily double it. And, and that was, it was really good numbers. When you look at that on a return basis, your actual interest rate that you're collecting on your hundred thousand dollar investment is like 30% or more, you know, it's like really good rate of return. So anyway, that's a great strategy. Uh, and, and so I applaud you for doing that. Um, what were some of the challenges that you, you had when you went to sell that thing with an underlying loan on it? Finding someone that was qualified to take over. That was probably one of the fine, the biggest challenges because you also want to make sure that the person you're selling it to can pay it because now you're going to be stuck with this loan. Now you're going to be, I would have to be paying my mortgage in this home if I, if I didn't find someone that could qualify for the home. Yep. So how did you go about doing that? And, and then I've got some ideas around, you know, the 10% down payment is is a is a decent kicker and I, I guess uh security against them defaulting and you having to foreclose. So but how did you go about finding somebody that was qualified? What 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 kind of um vetting process I guess did you do? So I became the lender and with my lender's advice on the side, we started, we we ran their credit, we ran their debt to income. So it you become the bank at that point because you're seller financing. So you again, you want to make sure that everything is in order, just like a bank would. And with my lender's advice on the side, it was a little bit, it was very helpful to have them walking me through the process of this is what we look for in a bank. Because again, owner financing, there's a reason why they don't qualify with the normal bank. So they're going to be a little bit harder uh, to bet than a normal bank. They're going to have the lower credit scores and they're going to have the higher debt to income. So we want to make sure that somebody who's going through that process qualifies. And we did do a higher down payment on them as well because we it's a big risk. Yeah. Okay, so you're 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 using this loan officer quite a bit. So that's a, another key point. Like, make sure you have a good relationship with somebody. Um, so yeah, if you're doing there's there's a couple other things. This is not investment advice. This is not um, legal advice or CPA advice. Uh, that caveat needs to be on every single episode. <laughs> um, but when you are running through these things, at least in Texas, we have you have to go through um, like a an RMLO, which is a registered mortgage loan officer in order to qualify consumers to buy properties. Uh, this is the latest understanding that I've got on this, right? And so we we do the same. We use somebody like that. They they vet them, they run the, their credit, they do all the things, and then they say they're approved up to this amount. And so, yeah, so you did all of that. And how, so right now you said your interest that you are going to earn on that deal is 34,000. Is that, is that over the life of the loan or how does that, how, how does that structure? It was a very, it's a small home. It was really an investment property, which is why I felt comfortable taking it on as well as yeah. my first investment, because I knew if something were to happen, I could also manage that payment without breaking the bank and without having to take away from my expenses that I already have, because I had just purchased my home uh, about six months ago. Okay. So I wanted to say that it was something doable in the case that I could not find someone right away. Yeah. Okay. And so was, what's that? We also went through a title company. To, just to like close. We were closing. Yes, yeah. because we wanted to make sure that all the documents were legal, that everything was changed over to the new owner and all they have their attorneys. So their attorneys help write those contracts and they help run the back end work that needs to be done whenever you transfer from one owner to another. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing that we have done in the past, uh, if you close at a fee attorney, I don't know if you're planning on doing this more in the future, but if you close at a fee attorney, fee attorney is essentially uh, an attorney that has the ability to write title insurance because they're attached to a title title company. Um, and this is specific to Texas. I can't speak for other states, but um, I used to work for a fee attorney and, and, and I was an escrow officer with them closing some deals. So the way the way it works, if you are like say you just bought the property and you bought it and you got title insurance on it, you know, 
a week or two ago, you did some repairs and then you want to go and owner finance it. A lot of times what we do is we will close at an attorney. Uh, we'll update, we'll do a bring to date or we'll do some kind of thing at the title company just to make sure that nothing else is attached to it. But we won't get full title insurance because it's just like another, uh, I don't know, thousand to $2,000. But if a buyer wants style insurance, we offer, you know, just, yeah, go ahead and get it, but you're paying for it type deal. So anyway, if you're doing this again in the future, it may be a way that that the buyer can save some in closing costs and you can just give them and show them, you know, this is the title policy that we just had. I'm so write that on- what's that? I'm going to write that one down on my notes. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it, um, because you really just got title insurance. The only thing that would attach to the property you would know about and you're the lender, you're writing the you're closing the deal as a lender. So you don't really need a lender title policy because you just bought it. Um, and so again, it, it turns it's into the buyer if they really want that or not um, as something to, to protect them. And i never discourage them from getting it. I just let them know, like I literally just bought this thing. Title's still clear from X, Y, and Z. Um, so anyway, okay. Uh, let's see. So again, your spread on the deal is, is going to be, uh, 34,000. Are you planning to do this strategy again? Or are you looking at other ways to invest? I still want the duplex. So that's right. where I have I said next. So yeah. that is my that's my goal for next year. If not the end of this year, the beginning of next year is to purchase the duplex. Okay. So what what are you trying to do in order to um one, I love that you have that goal. You already have it set. You already know what you're looking for, right? So that eliminates a lot of other things that you could otherwise get shiny, shiny objects into them and just kind of like look around and, and have, you know, 30 different investment strategies you're trying to implement all at one time. That makes it difficult. So if you know you want a duplex, uh, what are you doing to, to like, what, what are you tracking? What are you looking for? Who are you talking to, uh, to find that deal so that, that you can buy it, you know, like sooner than later? Yeah, so now I've ventured into the world of investors, which is amazing because they have so many off-market properties and I'm loving the off-market property market right now. It's a little bit different than your homes listed on the MLS. Um, I feel like with investors, they're open to negotiating a little bit more only because they they understand it and they live in that world of investment opposed to someone who's tied to a home and and they just have a little bit more emotion to it, which is valid. It's completely valid. But in the world of business, you take out that emotion and you focus on the numbers, um, which is why I'm I'm loving that off-market property, well, market right now. So I'm venturing into off-market and duplex is not necessarily what I need to buy. I'm also looking into multifamily, such as fourplexes. Um, we're running the numbers with fourplexes. I work with people who have... I helped clients purchase duplexes, fourplexes. Right now I'm working with someone who's venturing into commercial and he's wanting to possibly purchase his his biggest deal um, anywhere ranging from five to 10 because he's bought multiple properties with me before. So we have to run the numbers. We have to look at the, the price per square foot. We have to look at the rent rolls. We have to look at the utilities, who's paying for what, the tenant or the landlord? Um, how much money are you going to make off of that once you determine the total amount that you're going to spend, including that down payment versus your profit? Yep. Yeah. So one thing you, so five to 10 million or five to 10 units? Oh, five to 10 units. Five to 10 units. Okay. Yeah. Once you start getting into those, um, to that size, you start looking at it more on income basis rather than the, you know, I mean, I don't know, not, not as much, but, um, uh, y- you can make sure that you guys are underwriting that deal, uh, with the income approach in mind, not just the price per foot type thing, you know? Um, the expenses go up. You're really running. You start running more of a business than, and, and you're looking at P and L's balance sheet, that sort of thing, rather than than just like how much does each unit uh, rent for on a, on a per square foot basis. Obviously, that that drives the rents, but you're looking to increase the NOI, the net operating income, uh, because that's what exponentially increases the value of the property. Um, yeah. So I don't know how far you guys have dug into that and looked at that, but, uh, but those are, those are interesting. The other thing to note when you're talking to them, um, anything sub 50 units, uh, the management fees end up being a little bit more expensive. 
you know, 5%, 6%, 8%, just depends on what, what it looks like in your market. Um, or if they're going to self-manage it, then just know that going into it, you know, there's usually not room or space, uh, in the expenses to pay for like onsite management or anything like that for those things. And, you and don't at that want- time where he's at, because he's self-managing the other properties. And we talked about getting a property manager at this point because it, it's, and he still has his full-time job. So we want to make sure that it's something that he can manage and not just, I want to purchase the 10 units additional to the other one, two, seven units that he already has. Yeah. 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 So it's one of those things. And then the other thing you can look at, I don't know if he has any interest in selling, but if you wanted to sell any of the units and just start looking at the multis, um, you can 1031 into a bigger property and and put off paying the taxes on that stuff uh, on on some of those other. It's just w- with seven individual houses, um, selling off a number of them and trying to time it with the purchase of another uh, single asset may be a little difficult, but um but yeah, or if he sold those off and went for like a 30 unit instead of a 10 unit because he has more of a down payment to put down. Uh, something to think about. So yeah, yeah very cool. interesting. So I, I kind of want to go back and in uh, the time we've got left, just talk about your, you know, like either either the fears you may have had or may not have had when you when you took the the leap to go and buy something. Um, if you didn't have any fears, how did you how did you um why and how did you know was it just educating yourself or what was it uh because again there's so many people that i talk to and so many agents that i know that don't ever take the step they don't ever go start investing for whatever reason yeah so i think everyone may have a little bit fear i certainly did as a single mom i have to i'm the financial provider for my daughter she's starting school i have to buy school supplies pay for her school so there definitely was that fear of can i take on this loan while having my mortgage now. Um, And I know that, of course, my regular job as a real estate agent is still there full time and now leading a team. So it really was taking on a couple of things um, out, not at once, because I, I do try to manage everything and structure everything accordingly, and especially in my life to make sure that I that I have the the ability to do so while still taking care of my daughter. So there was definitely a fear. But I I see more success stories in real estate that the fear did not stop me. I get excited when I think, okay, I'm going into this deal. And just like I get excited for my clients, like you're purchasing your first property or you just made $50,000 of equity because you sold, you just held on to a, a house. You're living in a savings account. I tell that to my clients all the time. You're living uh, in your savings account. Like and it's it. just... Yeah the best feeling. So to me, I could either be stopped by this fear and stop now and not even take on a team because maybe it could hurt my production. Um, but if anything, it's helped it. So I think it's really just the way that you look at it. It's, it's really the pessimist versus optimist view. And to me, I, I try to be that optimist. Like, yes, it's going to happen. You will find someone. Why, why won't you find someone to sell this house to? You've done it for your clients before. So why can't you do it for yourself? And it really is just that mentality of, keep going and and you do it for the people, do it for yourself, keep investing and, and following some real estate gurus who have done it and talking to everyday clients who are ready to do it as well. And you see some clients that that come from nothing and they've accomplished so much just because they've invested. Yeah. So would you say that having purchased uh, an investment property and going through that process has now helped you with your ability to communicate with your clients. Oh, absolutely. And then they also see you as more of a reliable source because you have done it. It's easier to tell them you should purchase this property, you should buy this home, and I'm not even doing it. So I would realize kind of like a a tattoo artist, would you just trust a tattoo artist with no tattoos if they've never gotten one? Why haven't you gotten one? But you're over here giving them. So to me, it's the same thing. If I'm not purchasing my own houses, my own investment properties. I can't preach on them on the importance of purchasing properties. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, let's, let's end with that. I'm, I want to, I want to ask you a couple of questions. I haven't done this in a minute, but a couple of questions, not related to real estate. So one, what's your favorite pastime not related to, to work? Reading. Reading. Awesome. Any good books lately? Anyone should know about? Yeah. I'm reading build. Um, okay. 
out businesses and startups. Who, who who's the writer? Do you know? No, I'm not great Build. with telling okay. their names. I'll tell you right now. We'll throw a link in the show notes. I haven't heard of that, so <laughs> uh, so I'll look it up. Um, and then what, uh, what's something good? Uh, I like, I like some positive notes. Uh, what's something good's happened to you or your family in the last couple of months? Something good is we're taking a trip to Greece. My daughter and I love going on trips. Um, and this year I'm taking her to Greece. So that's awesome. the, the most exciting part. Turning 30. That's probably a, a big milestone for myself. And next month in August, I'll be turning 30 and, um, she's going to start school. So she's my little baby and that's always so emotional your kids are gonna actually go to school how how old is she she's five five she okay uk daycare before but you know once it's actually kindergarten it's different oh yeah oh yeah my son is six he's starting first grade so last year when he was in kindergarten it was the same thing we're like oh man you're becoming a little man <laughs> yeah all grown up yeah it's <laughs> awesome to see them uh five's a good age so that's cool yeah and yep 30 congrats on getting older <laughs> you're great you're coming join the crew yeah yeah um, i'm looking forward to my 30s i think my 20s were figuring out a lot of things and my 30s are okay i know what i want let's just go for them now yep yeah that's awesome i heard a good saying a, a buddy of mine said your 20s you're you're doing a lot you're you're running around uh trying anything 30s um, you like hone in on a few and then forties, you earn your money, fifties, you're done. Something like that. You know, it was like some, so, love to be done yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. And then, uh, finally, do you have one or two people who've been most influential to the way you think or your success? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say my mom, you know, who's not going to say maybe their mom, but my mom, she actually has never really worked. Um, but she's always had the mentality of figuring it out, no matter what what we do, where we're going, what's going on. She's always figured it out. And, you know, she does. She's together with my dad. Um, but, yeah, my mom has always been there's always a way. There's yeah. always a way. And the what if doesn't exist. That's her big in Spanish. The what if doesn't exist. And I go by that a lot. The what if doesn't exist. It's just you either do it or you don't. Oh, I love that. Yeah. That's great to finish on. Uh what if doesn't exist. Awesome. Um uh, and shout out to the moms out there. Uh <laughs> Miriam, it's awesome having you on the show. If you guys want to reach out to Miriam, uh, she's in the Houston market in Texas, then by all means, her contact information is in the show notes. Uh, it was awesome talking to you about your investment and what you've done and congrats on that. And I want to hear about the duplex, fourplex, whatever it is that you end up with. So keep going. I'll let you know. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you for me on. Yeah, for sure. All right, guys, we'll catch you on the next episode. Did you know that 80% of the agents we speak with got into real estate in order to gain passive income so they could obtain financial freedom and become work optional? If you want to stay up to date, the best way is to make sure you're subscribed. So if you haven't done that, go ahead and do it now. We'll catch you on the next episode.